Thank you, Matt. Uh, I think you've provided many ideas for energy efficiency in the market, and I was particularly interested in the concept of the saving purchase agreements. Your presentation is a great segue to our next discussion, which features Philippe Dunsky of Dunsky Energy Consulting, Stephen McDonald of Efficiency One, Ursilia Serafini uh, of the Summerhill Group, and Terry Young of the IESO. The session will be moderated by Frank Callanan, the President and CEO of Greater Sudbury Utilities Co of Companies since 2009. Frank is well known for his broad-based understanding of issues currently faced by the energy and telecommunications sectors. He will lead the panel in exploring the challenges and opportunities in transitioning from the previous conservation framework to a future state where energy efficiency may need to compete with other resources. Frank, I'd like to welcome you and the panel to the stage. I think we're all in our places. I was relieved when they brought the fifth chair up. I thought I was going to be the odd man out this morning, but thank you for the extra chair. Um, I just had a look before I came up, and I can report that uh, the vehicle carrying Nick Nurse, the Raptors coach, was just passing under the Gardner underpass on, uh, on York Street. So you may actually get a little in tonight when we're finished. That's the last Raptors I'll do. Um, this panel, um, following Matt's excellent presentation, is going to dig a little bit deeper into what's next in Ontario. Uh, for those of you in, uh, who, who practice in Ontario, uh, you will know that there's been some pretty significant changes to the way that conservation has been delivered um, in the past. So this panel is going to dig into what do we do going from here, not necessarily dive into um, whether or not those decisions were good decisions. Um, we think that uh, uh, the panelists that we have today have a, a wealth of experience, uh, both um, in Ontario and outside of Ontario. So let me um, begin to introduce them. Um, Stephen McDonald uh, is from Nova Scotia, so welcome to Jurassic Park, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy your, your stay here. Uh, Stephen is the CEO of Efficiency One. Efficiency One is the first um, not-for-profit um, operator, uh, electricity efficiency utility. Um, and um, Stephen's been the, um, the CEO of that utility for some time. He's been, um, he's been recognized as one of Atlantic Canada's top 50 CEOs uh, and as the recipient of Canada's Clean 50 Award, both acknowledging his industry efforts and promoting energy efficiency and reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, Ursilia uh, Serafini is the president and CEO of the Summerhill Group. Now, Ursilia told me to stop reading her bio at that point, so I asked her what she was passionate about, and she told me food. She also told me she just returned from a trip to Rome, and if you're interested in 120 great restaurants in Rome, see Ursilia. If you're interested in her uh, experience and contribution to the industry, visit the Summerhill Group website and uh, and it's that experience and, uh, and contribution that make her an ideal fit for this panel today. Philippe Dunsky is the president of Dunsky Energy Consulting. Philippe advises governments and utilities across North America on strategies to responsibly accelerate transition into uh, the new energy market with a focus on energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean mobility. Philippe is co-chair of Efficiency Canada and sits on the Government of Canada's Energy Thought Leaders Council, uh, Generation Energy, and on the Government of uh, Quebec's Climate Change Advisory Council, among other appointments. Terry Young, for those of you who are not from Ontario, um, is, the, uh, VP, is a VP at uh, the IESO. Terry's been with the IESO since we spelt it IMO back in 2002. Um, Terry is responsible for uh, in policy, engagement, and innovation. So welcome to all the panelists, and thank you for being here. So we'll open it up to the panelists to, uh, to just do some introductory remarks. 
Um, I've got notes all over the page about timing, so apparently we all have five minutes. I've used up mine. Terry, do you want to start? With, uh, sure. I actually want to get more into the discussion because I want to learn from these three people here in terms of what we can apply in Ontario. But just briefly, I mean, we're at a, a bit of a, a critical point here where uh, we have uh, finished one framework or winding up a, a one of the conservation uh, frameworks that was there. We're working with the LDCs. Uh, to, to do that, and we're starting what I would call simply an interim framework. So for the next uh, 20 months or so, or I guess a little less than that now, until the end of 2020, we are going to be uh, delivering conservation programs, centrally delivering uh, these programs. But I, I think the focus for all of us is really about what happens post-2020, that we've got a lot of successes that we can build on. I know there's a a few people in the room here. I see Gary from London and, and Joe from Toronto, Joe Bile and Nally was here from Electra. And the LDCs working with us over the last framework certainly uh, delivered a lot of results. And I think we have those results we can build on. Um, we're in this period now where we have existing programs uh, that we're gonna continue to, to, uh, to deliver. Um, but as we looked post 2020, I think certainly the challenges are a lot different than when we started this in 2006. Um, and that uh, while we've got a lot of uh, successes under our belt, the, the challenges are different, that we uh, have to look at, at how and why we're delivering this in particular. You know, I look at this more from a system resource, more as is something that can help the system. I think when I, when I you know, think of conservation uh, 15 years ago, it might have been more environmental benefit, it might have been more, even the last few years, it might have been more policy uh, that was driving this. And what we do see is, is a real need uh, for uh, this in the electricity system that the IESO manages, that it is one of the existing resources. As we look to see how these existing resources can look after future needs, I think conservation energy efficiency can be right there. And, and that's what I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because of the, the, the level of interest we're seeing this. And I think this is reflective too in this room. I think back to uh, six, seven years ago when we first started our stakeholder summits or our electricity summits, the first one we did at the Toronto Reference Center was 120 people. And I think 60 of those were from the IESO. Um, and now we have uh, 401 people that were registered today, and, the, and the, half of them are not from the IASO, I can tell you. Uh, but so we've got a lot of interest, and there's a lot of interest in the space, and it reflects also uh, the, the, how far the market um, in efficiency has come. Uh, we don't have to treat this the way that we did. There is a lot of capability out there, and we just need to figure out how to tap into that capability. Thank you. Philippe, would you like to make some opening comments? Sure. I was, um, I, I was giving some thought this morning, and, and as an aside, I realized afterwards I was giving more thought to what I was going to say today than to which socks to put on. I, I have a tendency <laughs> to always put on the wrong socks when I'm on these panel things. Feel any better? And you know what? I'm the closest and believe me, he's saying the right thing. <laughs> No, true story, a little while ago I was, I was on a panel like this and uh, I had to wake up really early in the morning to get to, to that place, which was a three hour drive away. And, uh, and I just fumbled and grabbed socks and, and, and went to the thing. And I'm sitting on this panel with the CEO of the gas utility and the CEO of the electric utility. And I look down and I see I'm wearing my daughter's socks. <laughs> One with the sparkles, 11 year old daughter. Anyway, um, so I was giving some thought to, to, to this and I was thinking back to to my own firm and to what we've been doing over, over the years. Uh, and, you know, thinking back when we started, we were doing a lot of designing energy efficiency programs. We were designing programs to, uh, you know, to promote and accelerate adoption of what? Of light, excuse me, light bulbs and insulation and, you know, eventually thermostats. And, and then I look at what we're doing today and we're still designing programs to accelerate adoption of, of those things. Uh, but we're also designing strategies to accelerate adoption of uh, solar PV, or distributed generation, of electric vehicle uh, smart charging. We're working on, on a project right now looking at how electric buses can act as mobile storage units for, uh, for the grid. 
uh, out in British Columbia. So this, is, this has changed dramatically in, I'd say, the past five years. And the reason I say that is the very first thing I want to do here is, is kind of level set. Um, we've been talking about energy efficiency for a long time. From my perspective, we got to stop thinking of that as its silo. This is demand side solutions. We've always been working on the demand side of the equation. Uh, and back before Internet of Things enabled so much more, that essentially amounted to energy efficiency. But today, you know, the doors have been blown open. And so when I'm thinking of this now, I'm thinking of demand side management or demand side solutions. And that includes efficiency, it includes demand response, it includes storage, it includes distributed generation, it includes electric vehicles. And so that, that opens up a different world and creates a different narrative. So the first thing I think we need to do is, is kind of rejig the narrative here. You know, this is not our light bulbs anymore. The second thing I, I think we need to do is understand the size and scope of this opportunity. So I was looking at a really interesting study uh, the other day that, that was looking at investment needs, so capital needs, if we are to actually achieve the, the carbon reductions worldwide that we're looking for. And you know, these studies are a dime a dozen, but really the interesting thing about this one was it actually separated those investment needs between the demand side and the supply side of, in this case, the electricity equation. So the demand side, today, worldwide, we spend about $250 billion a year on demand side solutions. We spend about one and a half trillion a year on the supply side. Right, two and a, two, 250 billion, one and a half trillion. Now, looking forward to achieve those carbon reductions, the demand side is, is slated to grow to nearly three trillion dollars a year. All right, from a quarter of a trillion to three trillion dollars a year. And what about the supply side? One and a half trillion today, one and a half trillion in 30 years from now. Zero growth on, on the supply side, 11-fold growth on the demand side. So my point being, the demand side of the equation has for very long, uh, very long time gotten the short uh, end of the, uh, of the what's, what's the expression I'm looking for? Short shrift, short end of the sure, stick, whatever. Um, because it wasn't really enabled, and it frankly was almost a marginal part of the equation. Going forward, the demand side of the equation becomes as, if not more important, as the supply side. And that matters a lot to making sure that we really think about this in a deep way in every aspect of what we do. So it has to go from, at, from, from being an afterthought to being a core part of, of the conversation. And so what does that mean for Ontario going forward? And I, I don't, I, I don't uh, pretend to have all the answers for this. And I know that we've had a policy change, and it's not time to, to, you know, to, to ask whether that was right or wrong. But there are a number of things that we can do going forward. Um, uh, Lorenzo earlier uh, was talking, and I thought made a really good point about the need to focus when we're developing or we're designing new, the new market, to think of this as a behind the meter market. That's one thing that we need to do. Uh, Matt talked about the importance of time and location and getting the price signals right so that a behind-the-meter the, behind market can actually operate effectively. So getting the price signal on time and location is something that we can work on. Data. Getting data on consumption to be transparent, to be accessible, and not just accessible to consumers but to third-party solution developers, that's something that we can do to move the needle on efficiency. Um, also, financing, again, Matt, Matt talked about that earlier, uh, is a really big part of the equation. And yes, ultimately, policy drives a lot too, and we will need policy, but we don't have to wait for policy to move the needle here. Thank you. Ursilia, um, energy efficiency in Ontario, what's next first, and then Roman restaurants after, if we can pick up some time. Perfect, thanks, Frank. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to be part of this conversation today, in part because Summerhill uh, operates right across the country. So we have been developing and implementing 
uh, energy efficiency and demand response solutions primarily for homeowners and businesses for, t for 20 years um, in just about every jurisdiction uh, across the country. So I have a bit of a unique perspective on uh, the impact that uh, policy changes can have uh, with this, within this sector in particular. So it's a, it's a timely discussion. The challenge and the, the uh, insight that we bring is that in the work that we do, we're not selling energy efficiency. My customer is the end user, and we're selling all the ancillary benefits, and it's been touched on a little bit today, but we're looking at home comfort, um, we're looking at, we're, tr we're trying to tell individuals and businesses that they're going to save money. We're using that, um, you know, as a bit of a, of a hook. But we're not selling energy. We're selling thermostats, and we're selling insulation, and we're selling furnaces. And so, so one of the biggest questions I think that we need to answer as a, as a sector is we need to solve this fundamental communication challenge. That would be, that would be one point that I would make. Um, within this discussion. The second thing would be to get really clear on who's benefiting, so the, on the value chain. And, and Matt talked a little bit about this. Um, really, who are the individuals, companies that are going to benefit from a market-based approach to energy efficiency? Because in many cases, uh, given where the policy sits around energy on a province by province basis. It's, it's not always that, that end user. You know, I was curious when I looked in this room and maybe just a show of hands, is there anyone from the in insurance industry even here today in the room? Anyone? So there's, there's no one from the insurance industry in the room and yet we hear a lot about, particularly when it comes to climate as well, resiliency and, and resiliency as a, as a value as it relates to energy efficiency and programming. This is a gap for us if I think about who's going to place value on the types of actions, uh, infrastructure, and technology that we're looking to drive. That's a big gap that there's, that there's no one here from the insurance sector from my perspective. Um, the final piece that I think is really important as we talk about scale, and again, this has come up. If I think about how to, how to get a market active, um, how to get prices down, we, we're talking about gaps in financing. Again, working right across the country. Uh, the populations of Saskatchewan and Manitoba together are around two and a half million people. It's estimated that there's two and a half million people outside today waiting for the Raptors rally, just to give you some perspective. And so again, when we start to think about driving transition and the fundamental hurdles we have to overcome, scale is really important from a Canadian context. Uh, in figuring out where the market players are going to pop up to find value to put risk on the line when you've got two big provinces in the country that together uh, have less people than might be, might be outside right now. So just some, some food for thought for our discussion. Stephen, could you tell us a little bit about Efficiency One and the lessons that we can take in Ontario from Nova Scotia's experience? Yeah, I think what might be helpful is um, Nova Scotia has a, has a bit of a unique model for energy efficiency. And so I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about uh, that model uh, in the context of electricity, of our electricity marketplace. So Efficiency One operates something in Nova Scotia called Efficiency Nova Scotia. And Efficiency Nova Scotia was designed as a one-stop shop for energy efficiency programs and services for Nova Scotia homes and businesses, uh, regardless of the fuel. And uh, now we're able to offer programs based on the funding we have, um, but on the electricity side, our electricity uh, demand side management is subject to a regulated framework that's uh, embedded in legislation. And so um, uh, a little bit of context. And so in Nova Scotia, we have one uh, electricity provider. It's fully integrated generation, transmission, distribution at Nova Scotia Power. In legislation, in our Public Utilities Act, uh, the electricity utility is legislatively required to purchase cost-effective and reasonably available energy efficiency. And that's actually embedded in legislation. And so those two terms are really important. So cost effective. Cost effective means that the benefits from energy efficiency must exceed the costs. Fairly straightforward. Reasonably available, not as straightforward, but essentially what that means is that there's a market exists, a marketplace exists for energy efficiency technologies. You can acquire those technologies in the province, 
there's capacity within the contractor market to be able to deliver, whether it's insulation or lighting products. Um, that market exists to be able to reasonably provide those energy efficiency services. And so it's a bit of akin to an efficiency first principle, which has been encoded in legislation in um, some other jurisdictions. Now, um, the electricity utility not only must it purchase energy efficiency, but it must purchase it from the energy efficiency utility, which is Efficiency Nova Scotia. So Efficiency Nova Scotia in law is designated a public utility. It's overseen by our regulatory body, the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. And uh, legislation also uh, explicitly sets out that the regulator must consider affordability when approving demand side management plans. So I think the previous uh, speaker uh, talked about you should acquire all cost effective energy efficiency. Uh, electricity rates are a big issue in our province. I know they're a big issue in many, many jurisdictions. And the regulator uh, is by law required to consider the affordability of energy efficiency plans in approving those plans. Um, now, second, because we're designated as a one-stop shop for energy efficiency programs, we also have non-electric programs. So reducing oil, natural gas, uh, whatnot. And um, that's not subject to a regulatory framework. It's a public policy objective. So funding comes under contract from the province of Nova Scotia, uh, supported in part by funds from the federal government and the Low Carbon Economy Fund. And um, but I think it's really important, there's a distinction between the electricity piece is encoded in legislation, the non-electric piece is a public policy objective. Thank you. So we're going to turn to uh, the audience now with another Slido poll to help direct the rest of uh, the conversation. So we've, um, we've, we've asked you to rank um, the things that you're most interested in hearing um, and uh, that will guide the, 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 the rest of this discussion. So I see we've got a number of people, not a very big number of people who have weighed in. Um, and uh, so far value of energy efficiency runs out in front. Frank, so, if I could maybe pick, on, pick up something that uh, Stephen talked about in terms of Ontario and different jurisdictions, if you don't sure, mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the, I think one of the big differences that you see in Nova Scotia that you saw in Ontario was this ability to treat the customer as one, that, that there was one entity that was delivering the, uh, these various programs, Stephen, that you have to this one customer. And I think this has been one of the, the challenges in Ontario. I think back you know, not so long ago, you'd have a, a gas utility, you'd have an LDC, you might have the IESO, you might have Green On, um, who can forget Green On? Um, and, uh, uh, and so you have that one customer that, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for, for this customer to be getting a number of calls and all trying to sell them energy efficiency or a reduction in their gas bills or reduction in carbon or whatever it is. And I think one of those, the, I think one of the, the lessons for us here is to be very clear that there is one customer uh, that, that uh, collectively we can't all approach separately, that we have to uh, uh, look at that customer as, as, as one customer who has got a number of offerings that can be made to that customer. Yeah, I think, um, just to add to that comment here, I think that um, becomes increasingly more important as you move beyond uh, some of the low-hanging fruit measures like lighting and whatnot the fleet mentioned earlier on. As you, as you get into you know, trying to encourage the customer to look at deeper retrofits, adopting more energy-efficient technologies, whether that's heat pumps or heating systems, it becomes even more important to have a relationship with the customer where you know you understand their needs, you understand their uh, usage profile from data you get from the utility or you collect yourself. That that area I think becomes even more important as you move into um, into um, you know different types of technologies. And you, you evolve beyond lighting. And if I may, on, jumping on that, just that on this survey, you know the the hot topic is competing with traditional generation. I would observe that that's probably one of the biggest challenges in energy efficiency competing with traditional generation. Is that, is that end use customer and that ability to figure out who, who is the one that's trying to target them in that value chain, whether it's an aggregation perspective or even you know, individual programming, it's very fragmented. You know, if we're focusing just on you know, industrial efficiency, um, that's one approach. But a lot of the times, and I, I know the work that we do, we're dealing with you know, residential thousands, millions of homeowners 
um, small commercial and even commercial buildings where there's that need to aggregate and that need to figure out who's the most respected voice in convincing uh, that decision maker that they should participate in these actions. And that's, I, I would argue that that's one of the, the biggest challenges with efficiency competing with traditional generation. Well, let, let's talk about that a little deeper then and maybe, um, maybe uh, Philippe, you can lead off on this. Um, uh, do you think that conservation uh, or energy efficiency programs can compete with traditional generation? How do they compete from a technical and, a, and a, an economic perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, they've always competed. So the only question is, can they compete well and fairly and, and, frank, and aggressively? Uh, and, and to my mind, that's really all about how we set up the framework and the, the market. Uh, so, you know, to use one example, right, that, again, I think, I don't remember if it was Lorenzo or Matt uh, mentioned earlier, uh, non-wires alternatives, right? So currently, or actually, let me go back a step. The previous framework in Ontario, as I understand it, was essentially said, you know, you've got 30 cent per first year kilowatt hour as, as the price to beat, and if you can do that, then go for it. And, and I was always kind of surprised by that, because what does 30 cents a kilowatt hour mean? All right? Because 30 cents a kilowatt hour might be a, a provincial average over time and space, but you're not getting provincial averages, you're getting, uh, you're getting savings at certain times in certain areas of the province. So looking forward, can it compete? Yes, if we set up a framework where the price signals are appropriate. So if we can, if we can for example, uh, say, you know what, before being allowed to invest in upgrading distribution infrastructure, right, you need to prove that you have, you've actually put together a plan that lays out, let's say, three to five years in advance, at least, what the projected need is going to be. So you give everyone a chance on the demand side of the equation to compete, to be able to defer that capital investment at a lower cost. Then I think the demand side, the demand side of this equation can effectively compete. If you don't do that, then we just wait until we're a year out or six months out and we have to invest in upgrading some equipment, the demand side can't compete. So again, framework really enables that. So I, I think identifying that need is really important. I think when you, when you look at some of the ways that this has happened in the past where, you know, there's been a target, but, you know, whether it's a, you know, you think about the 30 terawatt hour target or the 7 terawatt hour target, and you've got this target that's more based on a, on a policy outcome, if you will, than a real system need. And so what you've got, and as you are achieving that target, you're doing so, and, and conservation costs money in the short term. It is because you are investing in the future, and so you are spending that, that money in the short term. You're also in Ontario, as many other jurisdictions, you're at a point where you have more electricity than you need. So you seem to be working against that as well, even though this is about deferring longer term investment, not short term, -term investment. So I agree with Philippe that, that you, you want to identify that need. And then to the earlier point that you made about the demand side of the market growing, absolutely we need to see that continue. I think we've got some, some good examples of that. I, I, I can recall, you know, 10 years ago or so, going in as you do before you go to, before elections, you always go in and brief the opposition parties and tell them how great you are and when they're elected, why when they make changes, it should be about the other guy, not you, because you've got it all looked after. And I remember going in and actually talking to the, the, the leader of one of the opposition parties and talking to them about the market and saying that where you really need to see the growth in the market is on the demand side. And it was foreign to him. Like, what do you mean that, that, that there is such a thing as, well, once you got them to understand there was a market, but, but after that, that, that it would be the actual demand side, that it wasn't generation, et cetera, out there. And I think what we've seen, actually what we've seen in the DR community in Ontario, last four years with the auctions that we've had, the growth in the number of markets, the growth in the number of participants, would demonstrate that there's that capability that we need to build on. So, so Matt promised us that he would get us thinking and be a little controversial. He introduced this notion of an engineered solution versus kind of an insurance shared risk uh, approach to energy efficiency. Um, in an engineered solution, we know what 
a generator looks like when we build it. We know how long that asset's going to function. We understand its capacity factor and all of those issues. Do we have any experience or any comments on this idea of a shared risk insurance policy type approach to pooling um, energy efficiency? Stephen, do you want to lead off on that? It's a bit of a, um, so where I come from and, and the world that I live in every day, it's a little bit of a different model, if you will, in the concept of, um, of an aggregator, if you will, in pooling resources. But what I can say is common uh, to the model that we operate in is uh, measurement and evaluation of energy savings. And so uh, when we go through our regulatory body with our demand side management plans, energy saving reduction targets are set. And um, uh, we need to achieve those targets. It's all subject to independent evaluation and verification. Measurement is hugely important uh, to our day-to-day -day life. We have to make sure that the kilowatt hours we're taking off the system, they're there, they're reliable, because as you start to make uh, more indents into the load you're taking off the system, you know, system planners uh, need to be able to make long-term decisions off that. You need to make sure those energy savings are there and reliable. And so I think there's a common, uh, a common theme in measurement. Do we, do we have a high degree of confidence that between the hours of four and eight, we can, we can affect that duck curve? So, you know, one of the things that really struck me, I, I wrote this down from, from Matt's presentation, was energy efficiency is calculated, not measured. And I think that was a very powerful statement because it comes back to my earlier point about really getting clear on um, the impacts of energy efficiency and what we're trying to sell and, and who's extracting the value. It's messy. Right? And in the, the space that I operate in, which is largely focused on even behavioral changes, it's not even technologies where you're, you know, you're calculating the inputs and the outputs and figuring out you know, where, where to create um, that value in the system. It's really messy. It changes all the time. It has nothing to do with, with four and eight in some cases. In some cases, it can have tremendous impact focusing on you know, changing lighting schedules or uh, encouraging people to, to do behavioral actions that can have um, enormous system impact over the long term. But how we calculate that really comes back to, I think, from my perspective, that public policy imperative and getting really, really clear from the jurisdiction we're in, what is, what is, that, what is that end game from a public policy perspective? You talked about um, going in to, to talk with leaders of the opposition party um, Terry, and, and one of the biggest challenges we have in this space is these deep swings in how the, the politics are playing into um, where the value exists in this space, and that is, is very problematic. I can uh, maybe add just a little bit to, to, uh, to your question there. Um, I, as, as with many things, on demand-side solutions, you know, there's no silver bullet. Uh, you know, Matt, Matt, Matt does an amazing job of getting us to think outside the box. Uh, and my feeling is that, that things in this space are going to exist within the existing box and outside of it at the same time. So, you know, I, I run a firm of 30 people. Most of them are, are engineers. I'm not one. Um, uh, they will have a lot of work to do going forward. That's not going to disappear. But we absolutely can use big data in a way that we've never been able to before to use engineers and use the capabilities much more smartly, much more effectively, uh, and get so much more value out of, out of their time. I also think the same is true for financing, same is true for insurance products. So you know, we, we design finance strategies, financing programs and strategies you know, across North America. They are very, very good in certain cases, in certain situations at, at kind of oiling the machine to enable scaling of energy efficiency and other demand side resources. But they, they don't exist in a vacuum and they can't exist in a vacuum. Insurance products, I'm looking at you know, Julia Langer over here, at Toronto Atmospheric Fund, they're one of the first to, to actually go out and develop an insurance product for commercial energy efficiency to, again, oil that machine. So all of these things are absolutely essential. And as we go forward, we're going to add, we're going to bring more financing, we're going to bring more insurance product, and we're going to use data to enable those to come in and, and scale this thing up faster. But it doesn't mean that we're going to lose the engineers. No, but, it, but, it, but I think that the, the point, and I think this is a point for Ontario, is, is that as you look outside and you see what's available and what others are doing, 
and whether it's financing and arranging those financing solutions, whether it's insurance, whether it's development of programs, whatever it is, that, that I think this is where, if you look at the experience in Ontario, the experience in Ontario has always been the government directs, whether it's the OPA or the ISO, to take this amount of money and create this amount of results. And I think that, that when you look at what's changed today, what we've seen that change that's happening from the previous framework to this interim framework to the next framework is, is that's no longer the option that can be solely relied on. And to the extent it can be relied on at all, I don't know. But, but the point is, is that there is this capability in the marketplace outside, whether it's delivering programs, designing programs, arranging for financing, or whatever. And I think this is where Ontario needs to start to look and to start to see what others have done and bring some of that back. So, so that's interesting, and that really was the second issue that was, that was identified by the, by the audience as well. How, how do we do that? Because I think in Ontario, you're right, it has been a heavily incentivized uh, activity. And, uh, you know, from a utilities perspective, sometimes it was tough to get people to take free stuff. Um, and so now that we're not giving free stuff anymore, how do we create that value in a customer's mind? Is there an opportunity um, in a small commercial setting or in a residential setting, or are we back to industrial and large users? So I'll, I'll start with that. I think if you want to play in the market and you want uh, innovative solutions and you want new players to come up to you know come into this space, they need certainty. And I think the one thing that has been missing is the clarity. And I can't stress this enough. What is the value for energy efficiency in Ontario? Can we all agree that it is a system benefit and we're going to evaluate it accordingly? If we start there and work down, then I think that you will see opportunities come up, businesses emerge and evolve to deliver that service to whether it's a small commercial business or a homeowner, because everybody's clear on where it is valued in the jurisdiction. That's been the missing gap in going you know, from the bottom up versus top down. We need that top down clarity. We need to move away from pools of money against the defined outcome and the politics that that creates. We need to get clear on the value for energy efficiency in our jurisdiction for us, and from there, I firmly believe the market will evolve with innovative solutions. So where would you like to see those value flows come from? Is it all customer driven? Is it some customers, some public? So I come back to the earlier point I made, which was for the end use customer, I'm not selling them energy efficiency. So it's not, it's not customer driven in that sense. That's why you, know, you, you said, Frank, I can't even get them to take a product when I'm giving them away. I'm, I'm not selling them energy efficiency. They will take an action, but it's likely a, a player, another player in the market that's going to figure out where that value exists. So if somebody's going to pay because the system will value the certainty and the data that I can provide in aggregating those results for the small commercial business, then I have an incentive to go out and however I'm going to communicate and sell that to the small business, I will. It might be technologies, it might be behavior, it might be paired with, with data, but it's because I know that I'm getting paid on the back end because somebody else is validating the certainty that that provides to the system. And I think that's the gap that we've, we've had. We focus too much on um, specific technologies and incenting specific products without starting from who values this and then creating the market from there. Um, any other thoughts on that, Steve? I think um, from a customer perspective, it's important to understand uh, what's important to the customer. And so whether that's uh, their interest in energy efficiency because of the bill reductions or their interest in energy efficiency because uh, it provides better comfort or you know, maybe they're you know, concerned about the environment or whatnot, that's all really important. I think um, people, energy efficiency makes sense. Right? You can sit down, you can do the math, you can figure out a positive return on investment, right? There's a payback, these things make sense. But not everyone does it. And um, so whether it's uh, greasing the wheels, as uh, Philippe said, or oiling the wheels or whatnot, there's a need to overcome barriers. And so for some customers, that barrier is affordability, right? And so in some jurisdictions, they you know, provide incentives or rebates to help people with that affordability piece. 
Financing has become a much, much, is becoming a much, much more important issue as we look at deeper retrofits and having financing solutions. I think um, Matt's comment around you know, credit card financing is very relevant. I mean, that's a very expensive way to finance these types of things. Um, but also just information and education. People, we find, really just don't know where to start. And that could be um, anywhere from a, you know, from a homeowner to a large industrial customer. You know, they just often don't have the time or the knowledge to know where to start. And so uh, helping people overcome barriers is one of the most important things that we find in helping people adopt energy efficiency. Good. Um, maybe we could just run through and do a 60 second elevator pitch on what Ontario should do next. So, Terry, do you want to start? I'd rather these folks told me, and then I can tell them whether we're going to we're going to get the answer and work backwards from there. If that, okay, so let's start off then with Ursilia. Wow, well, I don't think I was prepared for this, Frank. What Ontario should do? Next? I wasn't either. It just came. Okay, to me. it just came to you. Well, look at that. I think if we can set a, a strong framework that this market can operate in and we can, we can determine and agree on the value for, for energy efficiency um, for this province, I think from there it will become clear the types of programs, services, uh, and market-based opportunities that we can then deliver in the market um, to, to meet that need. And to be more specific, you know, don't be prescriptive, right? I think we're coming from uh, an environment where we were very prescriptive. And in part, we didn't always have the data and the tools to be able to calculate it. So this industry was built on specific ins and outs that could be gained by picking winners in terms of technologies because it could be easily measured, you know, not calculated, and that was how our, our system operated. Again, I come back to that point of, set that framework, create the, the value, the value chain um, for how we value it and the, the importance to our system, and then let the, let the market determine the types of solutions that can achieve that so that we don't, we don't need to move back into a very you know, prescriptive framework and it can be much more um, driven and transformative and innovative uh, by the market. Thanks. Philippe, elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Um, well, <laughs> Ursilia said a lot of it already. It set the framework, right? So, so I'll just go a little bit deeper then into that. Uh, one piece is sending the right price signal. So again, valuing, whether it's energy savings or valuing whatever demand side solutions offer, whether it's energy or peak or ancillary or other benefits, but we, we, have to, we have to value those appropriately. We have to set up a framework where third-party providers, maybe it's Summerhill, maybe it's others, can access that value if they can deliver for cheaper into the market, right? But, but at a granular level, so that when Ursilia is out pushing uh, you know, home insulation, Right? She's getting a very different value stack and therefore has a different, different capability to use different levers than if she were pushing for light bulbs or thermostats. So setting that up right, I think, is, is really critical. Putting in place the building blocks for things, like I mentioned before, you know, non-wires alternatives, so that, so that from a planning perspective, we're not always waiting until it's too late for the demand side solution to come into play. And the only thing that we can do is add capital to, to fix a, a short-term need. I think getting on top of that would be extraordinarily helpful. Um, I mean, goodness, there's, there's so much to set up. If in the next couple of years we can set that framework in a way that the market can actually take it and run with it for, let's say, two-thirds of what needs to be done. Because there will always be a public policy component to this. There will always be individuals out there who are not able to access the benefits, uh, you know, irrespective of how the market is set up. And we will always want to serve them. So not throwing baby out with the bathwater. Policy really matters. But I'm absolutely in agreement with, with Ursilia's point. Focus on the framework, not on prescribing the thermostats or whatever other technology we want to push at the moment. Okay. Stephen. So similar comments on the framework. Um, we we'll just build on some of what's been said. I think it's really, really important that energy efficiency or demand side, um, demand side solutions, 
receive equal footing with generation. I think that's very, very important. So things like integrated resource planning, demand side resources have to have a seat at the table just like generation does. That's critically important. And I think the other point I'd add is valuing energy efficiency or demand side resources more than just uh, what would be the traditional avoided costs of energy capacity and transmission distribution. So things like non-energy benefits, things like property values, comfort. You can put values on these things. Other jurisdictions are doing it. I think that's really important from the get-go to get that embedded in any, any view of demand-side um, solutions. So I think it starts with need. You know, at the ISO, we talk about ensuring that electricity gets to, to where it's needed, when and where it's needed. Is, is, and I think efficiency is exactly the same thing with respect to identifying what the need is. And the need is not consistent across Ontario. The need is, is, is greater in some areas. I think of Leamington and what they're, what's going on there, seeing Ray and talking to him earlier about some of the solutions that we're putting in place to address reliability needs in that area that's one of the fastest growing areas in Ontario. And I think efficiency can be part of that. And I think that if so, so again, it's establishing the need, the need across the province, the need in aspects of the province, and then developing that market to meet that need. And, and so it, it, we, to, to Philippe's earlier comment, I mean, we really do have to develop the demand side of the market. That is, I think, critical if we're going to treat it this way, if we're going to move from the perspective of, okay, government directing, give, giving money with it, and then, and then you know, paying people to go and deliver that, um, or as opposed to, here's a need, let's develop the market, let's let the market respond. And the market has reached that level of maturity that they can respond. We just need to, to, to enable them to do that and to the point that Stephen was making about making sure that there are level playing fields here. Excellent. So we only have a few minutes left. If there's any questions for the panelists from the floor, um, Carrie will be along with the hook very shortly. Or maybe she'll be along with the hook a little sooner than I thought. Well, thank you very much, uh, panelists, uh, for the interesting conversation. Thank you to the panel for that discussion. And at this point in time, we are ready to take our final break of the day. If um, everyone can be back here by 2.45, we will get uh, on with the last portion of the agenda and have you out uh, in time. Thank you, 2.45.